tests writing these things. And they're a really odd piece of writing. There's nothing really quite like an artist statement, actually, um, in terms of professional writing that people have to engage in. So there's a lot of different types of artist statements. There's a lot of different reasons why you need to write an artist statement. And we're going to be going through, I, I came up with 10 do's and don'ts of artist statements. And we're going to go through those. And then I'm going to read some examples of different artist statements. And we can pick those apart a little bit as well. So here we've got the death of Murat uh, as well, of course, writing uh, in the first slide here. So the first thing to think about when you're writing an artist statement is who is reading your artist statement. Okay, so this might seem like an annoying part for a lot of people. But the, the first hurdle that you're going to need to overcome is thinking about who is the person that's reading it, not even their title. The best thing that you can possibly do is find out literally who it is. So if you're writing an artist statement that's going to be read by um, a committee that might be accepting applications for an MFA program, for instance. Find that professor in the profane painting department and think about them, research about them, and literally cater your artist statement to that person. If you're writing for a residency, uh, you're going to want to cater that artist statement to that residency. If you're writing for somebody who's walking into a gallery, your paintings are up on the wall and they have a little piece of paper and they like the painting so they look at the piece of paper, that's the person that you're going to be writing to uh, in that context. There's also, uh, you know, websites have a different type of artist statement as well. An artist statement on a website might be kind of a mix of a bio because you're trying to mix your bio a little bit with your statement, give a little bit more um, process as well. But it's something that's kind of for the average person who might be perusing a website and finding your site as well. It doesn't need to be some academic difficult piece of writing. But of course, there are artist statements for academics that are in that context. And that's a, another different type of artist statement that you have to think about as well. Uh, gallerists, of course, oftentimes will write artist statements for artists. And um, that's not exactly a big secret, I don't think. Artists, you know, the thing with, we're, we're looking at Egan Sheila right here. Yeah, we have, we have text in front of us, and we have an image in front of us. Here's a, here's a painting by Egan Sheila. So when we, when we look at this painting, we can just take a second. Let's take 10 seconds and just look at that painting with no words. Okay, now we have words on the right side. Notice how visual media, when you just look at it, that's what we're supposed to be doing with visual media, is using our eyes to look at stuff. And there's no words. That's part of the point of painting, okay? So when we try to put words onto paintings, it immediately gets a little bit convoluted, right? And so when you're in school, perhaps, or maybe you have to write something for a gallery or whatever, you have to put some words that accurately describe what's going on visually. Something else is happening visually. Okay, so there's, a, there's an entire book called The Painted Word by Tom Wolfe that is all about this. This is a great book to check out if you're interested more in this topic. What's the point of using words with a visual medium? Okay, now that I'm not coming off and saying words have no... Um, pertinence to visual media. However, understand they're two very, very different things. The what you get in a painting, you're not going to be able to get with words. And a lot of times when you put it into words, it gets a little bit convoluted and mushy, right? So approach it with this. A lot of people are like, I'm not a good writer. Okay, fine. You know, have somebody else write it for you. Really. Um, probably the easiest uh, exercise that you can do with artist statements, people do this all the time in di different lessons, is literally just trade artist statements with somebody else. So, so find somebody else who you like, uh, who you consider a colleague, or go online and find somebody who's one of your peers somehow, 
and just say, I'll write your artist statement and you write my artist statement. Those statements are usually better than the ones that the artists write themselves because immediately the artist is taken out of the situation. We get caught up in our studios, in our closets, <laughs> right? Um, and we, we think we're doing all this stuff. We're in our heads all the time and maybe... You know, if you're somebody like me, a lot of these ideas get jumbled around in your brain from time to time. And uh, but you're making connections like a conspiracy theorist in some sort of way. And it's all connected. And you're experiencing life at the same time, having synchronicities in real time. And this is a perfect example of artists uh, trying to to take the visual world and make it literal. You're witnessing it right now with my words. So basically what I'm saying is take a step away from this giant cosmic soup of our life, right? This, all these problems, all these things coming into these lives, all these great things coming in, all these memories, and that time you were watching Saturday morning cartoons and wanted that toy on the TV or whatever, you know, all these things make this big mush of us. And it creates a sort of bias that we have with our own work. Often the, the most difficult person to look at your painting is yourself. You're going to be the harshest. Hopefully, <laughs> you're the harshest. And, and it's very common with artists who I've respected a lot throughout the years. I meet them, and I'm kind of amazed that they're not like feigning humility. It's like when you're dealing with painting itself, you're dealing with a canon of painters that go back thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Here we've got Egan Sheila right in front of us. Who am I to be talking about Egan Sheila, right? You know, all of a sudden, we're, am I part of this thing? I'm doing this same thing that he did? I'm looking at his art and getting to interpret it? We get to think about Da Vinci and use the same materials that Da Vinci did? They're not that, you know, sacred and, and uh, or not sacred, but they are sacred materials. But they're not that difficult to find these materials, right? We all have that same paint. We all have the same ink. We all get those same brushes. But what's inside of us makes it move in very, very different ways. So by doing this really simple exercise, have your friend write your artist statement, you write your artist statement for your friend, immediately that different viewpoint is going to bring up some things, hopefully, that you never saw but also, it gives you a sort of freedom with the work, right? And when we're looking at our own work, we have so much invested in it that oftentimes it can really harm us from putting it into words accurately and clearly. So my first bit of advice in writing a great artist statement that doesn't suck is to find a friend and have them write your artist statement and you write their artist statement. And if nothing else, you can just take certain sentences, certain phrases. You might find, you know, just two words together in that entire statement with something nice that maybe you could use in your own statement as well. So think about who you who is reading your statement. That's the, the first lesson, number 10. Do think about who is reading your statement. Is it an artist residency? Is it a professor that might let you into an MFA program? Is it a gallery goer off the street? Is it somebody that you're applying for a grant for, right? Um, in those cases, obviously, you're going to cater that. And a lot of time, grants are community-oriented sort of things. So you're going to want to highlight things that check the boxes for that grant, right? So if it's a grant about community engagement and you give them an artist statement about you living by yourself, making videos of your feet, smushing jello. Um, then that's not going to connect with them. But if you write a grant for somebody in, interested in community engagement, you're like, oh, yeah, I worked with a bunch of kindergartners, and we had them draw these little pictures, and then we blew up these pictures, and we made this big collage or whatever. Um, you know, write it, write your statement for the person reading it, right? They want their life as easy as possible. Oftentimes, these uh, these grants and these sort of things are incredibly competitive, so get a little bit into the mindset as well of the people reading your artist statement, right? So somebody that is about to give you $10,000 to make some paintings may have already looked at 80 different artist statements that day. 
Do you want your artist statement to be difficult to understand for that person? No, <laughs> right? You want that? You want to check boxes off for that person in their head? What's this grant about? Oh, wow, th this is the same thing the grant's about, right? So make it simple for these people reading it to understand. Do you think Joe Schmo coming off the street who just got, you know, you know, a Shake Shack and some fries and a shake and he's walking around going to galleries and he's like, oh, I like these paintings. I wonder what this is about. He picks up an artist statement. What do you think he wants, right? That's something different. But if you're um, going for a residency, you might want to stress the fact that you're not crazy <laughs> in your artist statement um, because you have to actually live with other people there. Anyway, the idea is write your statement for the person reading it and consider the person, your audience, reading it and gear your statement towards that person in that context. So a really good way, here we have Alex Katz painting, um, a really good way to find out what your concrete language is, is to imagine telling somebody in an informal setting about your work. Now this is another trick that I use with my students. I ask them to imagine you're back at a family barbecue, if your family barbecues, right? You're at a family event of some sort, and a lot of you are probably like, oh my god, I hate talking about art with my family. Um, so you're at a family event, and your, your great aunt, Sophie, she's 92, and she's, she makes afghans, right? And they're great afghans, and she's, she's awesome. And um, she comes over, she says, what are you doing with those paintings, you know? And um, you, you want to be honest. You want to convey actually what you're doing, right? And you, you got to look for that concrete language in this context. How are you going to talk about your work? Are you going to talk about Foucault and Derrida and, you know, all this sort of stuff? No, right? Well, I don't know. Maybe Sophie wants to hear about that too. Um, no reason why not. But... What I'm saying is, think of an informal setting where you have to ta tell somebody about your work. You have no idea. Maybe they know a lot about art. Maybe they don't know a lot about art, right? So look for that concrete language when, when you're asked, what do you do, right? And this can be a really difficult question for a lot of people to answer because oftentimes we think that our paintings are supposed to be meaning so much more. Part of academia in this world of art schools right now is that you know all this concept and content should be embedded into the work itself right and i think this is important to do i might disagree with some of the tactics that people use in order to to get there and what they think is being embedded in the work um, but nonetheless you don't have to think about your work representing everything in the big giant universe I like to tell my students, think what is the biggest umbrella of what you do? And by that I mean, what is the basic thing you do? Do you make abstract paintings? Do you make figurative paintings? Do you make abstract figurative paintings? Do you make paintings that look like comic book characters? Do you make paintings that look like street art? Do you make paintings that look like they were painted by Caravaggio? Do you make paintings that look like they're made by the cave painters. What is the main basic thing that you're painting? Are you painting landscapes? Are you painting your family, right? What is the subject of your painting? What is it about, right? So that's one of the most important things. Get into that basic, we'll get into that more later, but think about broadly, what it is it, what is it that I'm doing? Oh wait, maybe these are landscapes, right? Maybe this is just abstract figurative painting of cyborgs. Simple, right? It doesn't have to be this giant thing and talking about uh, your perception of the world and the time you stubbed your toe, right? On a, anyway, make it simple. Keep it simple. So uh, another thing is think about, this is number nine, do think about what you want from an artist statement. Imagine that you're the one going into a gallery and think about this. What's the first thing that you do when you go into a gallery? Do you walk up and get the statement and read it before you look at the work? Or do you look at the work and then maybe you read the statement? I personally like to look at the work with no statement. 
sometimes I'm a little confused. Sometimes I want to laugh. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll go for the statement and read it. And then it's like, oh, my God, you know, watching Honey Boo Boo or something. I'm, geez, I mean, like, hate reading it. Because um, I think s statements can be so terrible. Uh, the over-intellectualized ones can just be so laughably awful. Um, but anyway, think about how you approach work in galleries and do you walk up to it look at it on the wall or do you start reading about it first i think most people look at it on the wall first now think about if you were that person that walked up and looked at all the paintings first what do you want in that statement that you're going to read in your hand you know do you want just a couple little easter eggs maybe just a couple little bit more hints about what's going on in the work you don't have to beat them over the head with it you don't have to, it doesn't have to be two pages long, right? So think about exactly what you would want in an artist statement. And um, it's kind of like the idea that if you want to make t-shirt designs, I remember this, you know, eons ago when I was making t-shirt designs, but the, the person I was working with would always say, you know, imagine that you want to make this shirt for yourself. You should design this shirt with, in mind that you would wear this shirt. You would think... It was a good shirt to wear, right? Um, and that that becomes tougher, I think, now because especially we're kind of conditioned to really consider, oh, my audience, and and all of you watching this are my audience, and I'm supposed to consider um, what all what everybody thinks, and and YouTube gives me results of, oh, I said this word, and that got that made a spike in in how many people watched it at that point, or oh no, I'm losing retention rates, all this sort of stuff. We, we consider the audience and we look at them statistically trying to figure out what does the audience want. But oftentimes just think about what you want, right? Think about what you want in an artist statement and then write that. Maybe you want something super intellectual and that's how you are. Fine. Put that into your artist statement then. But consider yourself in that moment of reading an artist statement in a gallery and what you want from it. Okay, another thing with artist statements is that they're constantly plagued by lists. Artist statements are full of lists. People do this all the time. It's like comma, 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 chameleon. It's a lot of lists. It's a lot of commas everywhere. So here I made up this ridiculous uh, phrase right here. My work examines and bifurcates the symbols, modes, traditions, representations, and limitations of the human mind, right? So this part where it's like, bifurcates the symbols, modes, traditions, representations, and limitations of the human mind. Why do I, what, what's up with that list? I don't need that list. Just make it shorter, <laughs> right? If you're using lists, stop. Just don't use lists. That's all there is to it. If you need a list, you're trying to say too many things at the same time. Say one thing with your sentence, and that's it. We get it. When you use a list, it's like you're you're trying to just jam. Oh yeah, I want to do this. I want to. Oh, and I I watched, looked at comic books in seventh grade. I loved the Wolverine, and uh, but I really used to like the Smurfs too, right? We don't need all that. We just pop culture, comic book references, done, right? So here's what we we got into previously. What is the subject of your art? Here we have the Norman Rockwall painting. We got Thanksgiving coming up next week, so I thought this would be pertinent. Um, what is happening in this painting? What's the subject of the painting? Is it the turkey? Is it the entire family together? Is it the man at the center of the table looking down at it? Because things are kind of pointing towards him, right? But this guy's looking at somebody, isn't he? Down here. So maybe you're the subject of this painting, looking at this scene. So that becomes the subject of the painting. So think about what actually is the subject of your art. What is it actually about? And again, this becomes, I think, more and more difficult now because a lot of people are in the painting, which is really cool, 
and I watch a lot of different accounts on Instagram, and I'm amazed. I There's so many good paint, paintings being made right now. But oftentimes we can get really, really caught up in technique and processes, and when we're just sitting there scrolling on Instagram, and all of a sudden we're like, ooh, yeah, that's nice. I like that. That's cool. I want to use that. We're, we're just kind of mindlessly scanning through all these different techniques and not necessarily focusing in on one particular thing, which is the subject of the painting itself. So is it a subject? Is it the turkey, right? Think about what is the actual painting about altogether as one. And uh, that's going to be the most important thing in your artist statement is simply look at 10 of your paintings and figure out what is the subject of all those paintings, right? Just got attacked by a dog. Um, so subject of your art, super important. Think about what is this actually about? And that goes back to the, the barbecue, right? We're back at the barbecue figuring out what is the, the basic concrete language that we can use to describe our art itself, right? What is the subject of your art? What's it about? Here we can look at this Philip Guston painting. What's the subject of this painting? What is it about? This doesn't have to be um, some intellectual feat. I know a little bit about Philip Guston, but of course we can think about being kind of cloistered in this environment. This cheap light bulb hanging from the ceiling. It kind of feels like my closet. I'm kind of in a Augustinesque closet. Maybe I should get a light bulb hanging from my ceiling. Empty bottle, you know. So here we have a portrait by Picasso of Dora Mar. And the subject is a person, I even know her name, Dora Mar. That was Picasso's mistress, right? So all of a sudden we're learning about the subject of the painting. We know it's an actual person. And this was a problem I had, I think, with a lot of my paintings even. I was getting so into technique and I was like, wow, wow, this is working out so well. Because um, I'd make abstract figurative work. And just combining those two elements in and in itself is a really fun, playful thing to engage in. But then, if you're just making portraits, who is the portrait of? That's one of the first questions. And it was like, I've been making these paintings for all these years, and I never thought the, the basic question to begin with could be, who is that person? Who is it actually in the painting? What is the subject of the painting itself? You can also use these word clouds to you know, look at different uh, words that you might use a lot. If you're, if you're using a blog, basically, I've got some images of my blog here. And um, basically what I do is I've created this blog. It's just a Tumblr. It's at lunarcave.com if you want to go check it out. Um, but this is my painting research blog, and I've made these categories for it, and then I just hashtag these categories and I can separate things into different uh, components or whatever you want to, categories, I guess. And the categories are painting vlogs, so that's when I, I just walk around my studio at the end of every day, every session, and just do a quick two-minute video um, of that. Then I have research. This might be things like articles that I look at, uh, different texts that I, I think are interesting and relevant to my work. Then I have artists to look at. So sometimes I, f I see artists doing something that I'm really interested in and I want to write them down because otherwise I'm going to forget their name and I'm going to forget it ever existed. It's kind of like working like a writer in this regard as well where a writer carries one of those little books around with them in their pocket, right? And when they come up with ideas, you just jot it down because otherwise it's just going to vanish. So this is a way I kind of look at different texts, different artists that I'm looking at, and again, if you want to write a good artist statement, who do you think you look at for other artist statements? Find an artist that you like and look at their statement and look what they wrote about their work. Um, don't think badly about them if it's horrible, though. Um, but that's a really a good place to look for artist statement, to mine for artist statement material. 
articles about the artist that you like, interviews with the artist that you like, your artist that you like's statement, right? Pull stuff from that. Everybody's pulling from everybody else. I have a section called notes where, you know, I just write stuff down all the time and um, I can just take photos of it and then I hashtag it notes and upload it to my Tumblr. Dreams, for a while I was actually recording all my dreams. My paintings, so I put my finished paintings up. Source material, maybe I'm walking around and I see something interesting that I might be able to use in a painting so I can take a photo of it, hashtag it, put it on my blog. And then painting course, which is what y'all are on right now, right? So that's one way that I kind of mine for this little world that I've created and that I'm investigating and looking at with my paintings and also making paintings. Uh, another great book is um, Notes from the Woodshed by Jack Whitten. It's an amazing book, and these are all just notes that he wrote, um, painting notes that he wrote himself, and none of these were meant to be actually um, published. Like, he didn't think he was writing a book when he was making these little notes, but he, he put the date on them, and then he would just write a quick paragraph perhaps, about what he did that day. It could be, you know, things that happened in his life. It could be things that happened with painting. It could be his things about history. You know, it didn't really matter, but he could take down these short little notes every single day. So if you want to write a great artist statement, I know it might not uh, seem like something that really interests you at the time because you got to write this artist statement in three days or you got to write this artist statement in two days. Um... But if you want to write a great art statement, just do, you know, get a stack of note cards and just write a note about what you did that day, some artist that you found, some quote that you liked, whatever it is, and just start collecting all these notes, um, put them on your blog, and uh, put them on your blog. Another good thing about, you know, have the blog format, I actually like this type of grid format because you can see all this stuff together, right? So you can see books that I'm reading. You can see here's kind of like a lowbrow uh, 1970s science fiction book cover artist, you know, here. And um, here are some quick sketches that I did. Here's the cover of a book I saw in a thrift store that I liked. Um, here's just some bark, right, in the source materials section. So you can see you're kind of creating this whole world um, that you're, you can mine for ideas right? And there's actually a term for this. It's called rhizomatic research, which comes from uh, Gilles Deleuze and his, his ideas, which are always in art schools, of course, um, that are really complicated. He does have a great paint uh, book on Philip uh, Francis Bacon, though, um, which is actually quite accessible if you want a, a good uh, text on a, a certain artist. That's good to check out. But anyway, uh, Gilles Deleuze came up with this idea of rhizomatic research, meaning that a rhizome goes out and it's got all these different things that are popping up, right? They have different stems popping up at different locations. It doesn't have to necessarily go down, straight down and make roots off of one thing. It can create new branches all across uh, the forest floor. So thinking about your research in that sort, same sort of way, you can imagine maybe I'm looking at comic books and uh, also biology textbooks, or I'm really interested in tadpoles, uh, or whatever it is. But think about all those disparate things and start bringing them together, and you'll start creating uh, a world that you can you can mine for your artist statement. But also read Jack Whitten's uh, Notes from the Woodshed as well. I think it's like my favorite pa book on painting, actually. So. Another another don't, don't use qualifying language. So qualifying language is language that is things such as my goal is, I seek, I try, I want, right? So you want to just speak directly to what it is that you're doing. I do, right? Don't use something like I really want to convey. It's too many words and you're saying like I want. No, you don't want, you don't try. You do. What is that? There's the Yoda quote, there is no try, only do, or something like that, right? So <clears throat> talk about yourself in that way in the artist statement. It just uh, shows that you're confident in what you're doing, and it's also shorter. It's more concise. 
don't repeat your work. Or uh, number five, don't repeat yourself. So a lot of times you'll see the same idea just repeated like three times. You, you, it can be better to just keep it short and you don't need to just say it again and again and again. I made up this kind of ridiculous sentence here. Uh, Through my work, I do this thing. By doing this thing, I do my work. So there's often this kind of circular weird reasoning in artist statements where they talk about this and they repeat the same thing over and over again. So don't repeat yourself. Use concrete language. So it's really important to just kind of hammering away at the same things again, but you want to use really, really concrete language that makes a lot of sense to people because we, we don't know where they're coming from, right? And, um, or, well, we do know where they're coming from, but we want to convey very simply what is going on in a visual medium. And we do this by being very concise and very concrete with our language. The more we intellectualize and the more we make it difficult, we might actually lose people who are looking at the painting and then reading the thing, and there's that disconnect, right? The, the ideal situation is one where the painting itself matches the text as well, and they both help each other out. That's ideal. It's, it's hard to do that, and it's rare, but that's what, you, what you're shooting for. Um, I would shy away from getting really creative with artist statements as well. I would treat it kind of more as a professional text just because, you know, you don't necessarily want to confuse people at this stage. There, if you think about in the gallery context, if we go with that one again, somebody walking into a gallery, looking at the paintings on the wall, picking up a thing, looking at it, do we really want to confuse them in that moment and make it hard for them to understand what we're saying? We want to make it really simple, really concrete, and to the point. This is the this just reiterating the uh, the same point. So you can actually Google out artist statement generator, and basically they take take all these different buzzwords in art and they kind of mash them all together into this uh, this amalgamation. Uh, that we see in front of us. So this is m created by AI. This is an artist statement created by AI, and it says, my work explores the relationship between gender politics and emotional memories. With influences as diverse as Nietzsche and Roy Lichtenstein, <laughs> new synergies are crafted from both traditional and modern dialogues. So a lot of this sounds absolutely ridiculous, like with influences as diverse as Nietzsche and Roy Lichtenstein, I would never actually say, like, start a sentence like that with influences as diverse. Like, don't talk about your influences in that way. You don't want to just, like, start off an artist statement by saying, oh, here's the, here's the people that I'm looking at, right? Because then you're basically just kind of copying um, somebody else. I would not sh give a shout-out to another artist early in an artist statement. So this AI is bad. Bad AI. Um... But new synergies are crafted from both traditional and modern dialogues. Uh, okay, not terrible. Ever since I was a teenager, I've been fascinated by the traditional understanding of the mind. Absolute garbage. Because it's like, what is the traditional understanding of the mind? What, what's that mean? You know? the tra Oh, right. You know, the traditional understanding of the mind. It implies that we all agree that there's some traditional understanding of the mind. We don't, right? So another bad, uh, sorry, um, Alexa, but you're not doing a good job. Uh, what starts out as vision soon becomes debased into manifesto or of defeat. Into a manifesto of defeat. Okay, a manifesto of defeat. I kind of like that. Leaving only a sense of failing and the dawn of a new reality. Not terrible. As spatial replicas become reconfigured through boundaried and personal practice. See, this is where I'm, I'm pushing spatial replicas. What? <laughs> like, if you actually saw that word in an artist statement, um, what's a spatial replica? A replica of space. <laughs> that is some artist statement um, language right there. Uh, the viewer is left with an insight into the edges of our culture. Oh, really? You're telling us what the viewer is left with? Wow, that's great. I also wouldn't do that. Don't talk about the viewer. 
the viewer who's the viewer right you're implying what they do what they're gonna see they get an insight into the edges of the culture what if they come in and look at your paintings and don't get this insight into the edges of our culture what's our culture too by the way whose culture right so this is a pretty terrible ai artist statement but it, it makes fun of this idea that artist statements are really difficult and in, intentionally convoluted, which a lot of them are. A lot of them do try to be way too smart because people go to school for too long and um, they get too too caught up in their own head and they, they write this sort of nonsense, right? And this is an attempt by AI to kind of re recreate that nonsense, but it's still bad nonetheless. So use analogies. The analogy I like to use is that the art world is kind of like the show Shark Tank, right? And there's all these different rich people, and some of them are collectors, some of them are gallery owners, right? And then the little artist has to come in with his, you know, cupcake machine or whatever and say, like, here's my cupcake machine, do you like it? And they have to kind of do a song and dance, right? Everybody kind of gets this analogy that's seen the show Shark Tank and how the person coming in kind of has to feel and how the, the people have power that have money and control of galleries and these sort of things. But analogies work because they, they give us a really simple way to think about work. So I, I would actually encourage using analogies in painting, um, artist statements, just for their ability to resonate with people. And also, this kind of goes back to the barbecue conversation. Hold on, i got to get water. This kind of goes back to the barbecue conversation as well, which is an analogy is a really simple way. You, you know, it's like, you know Michael Jackson in Thriller? Or we're not supposed to think about Michael Jackson now. Um, but, you know, you know that jacket that Michael Jackson wore in Thriller? Oh, yeah, I know that jacket. He's like, I want my paintings to look like that. And you're like, what? You know, like... That's a good analogy that everybody kind of understands, right? So think about analogies in your painting or in your artist statements that you can use. And analogies just in general can help you boil down what it is that you're doing with your work as well. So uh, the last one, number one here, is don't use passive language. And this is another kind of just a writing thing, a writing tip. Um, but... It's the difference between I painted this, right, versus the painting was made by, right? So you want to use the most direct language possible and not passive language. The painting was made by a technique of combining, you know, uh, elephant dung with black, ivory, black, whatever, right? So, um, wow, ivory and elephant, I wasn't expecting that off the top of my head. But I painted this, right? I painted this using ivory black and elephant dung. Right? It's just simpler. So use more direct language. Don't look for, uh, watch out for passive language. There are people that actually, um, what do they call Copy ed editors? <clears throat> but you can probably find somebody online, maybe on Fiverr or something like that. You could find that's basically just a proofreader. And you could tell them, like, I don't want to use passive language or call me out for passive language. And um, they would just be able to look at it from an, English, an actual English perspective of how you're writing and making sure that it's the most direct as possible. If you're writing in a, in a second language, uh, definitely get somebody else to, to check it before it goes live and have that person be tough with you. Um, sometimes friends and family don't want to correct you as much as somebody that's paid to actually correct your stuff. So get a copy editor. Sometimes if you're in school, sometimes universities actually have writing um, sessions that happen at the library. Um, at least I know the University of Colorado Boulder did. And uh, they would just pretty much, you could drop in and just talk about your work with them. So that could be a good spot if you're in school as well. Find the, the writing center. Find out if your university has a writing center. So here we've got everything together. Uh, do think about who is reading your statement. Is it for a gallerist? Is it for an MFA application person? Do consider what you want in a statement at a gallery. Don't make lists. Do have a thesis. Don't use qualifying language. 
Don't repeat yourself. Do use concrete language. Don't use abstract language. Do use analogies. Don't use passive language. So we let's look at a couple. I, I was looking at a lot of different um, artist statements, and in doing so, <laughs> there was a couple of people I really like, actually, as painters, and I looked them up, and I was like, oh, I should use their artist statement. And then when I read their statements, I'm like, I can't in good conscience uh, tear this person's statement apart um, because I like their paintings so much. So I looked at super famous uh, artist statements. Here we have A. Weiwei's, uh, I. Weiwei's statement. Um, this is on his website. So we think about that's the context that we're in where somebody coming to his website, he's somebody who's super famous. So he's probably getting a lot of different people coming to that website. It's not just, you know, uh, people in PhD programs or some academic um, residency or something like this. It's kind of the every every Joe, every Joe or Jane schmo, right? That that's stumbling upon this, and we get we get the uh, the bio and the artist statement here. A Y way. Ai Weiwei is renowned for making strong aesthetic statements that resonate with timely phenomenon across today's geopolitical world. From architecture to installations, social media to documentaries, Ai uses a wide range of mediums as expressions of new ways for his audience to examine society and its values. Recent in exhibitions include a bunch of smart places and famous galleries, right? Then we get to the bio. I was born in Beijing in 1957 and currently resides and works in Berlin. I is the recipient of the 2015 Ambassador of Conscious Award from Amnesty International and the 2012 Václav Havel Prize for Creative Dissent from the Human Rights Foundation. Václav Havel Pri Prize, of course, we got to give it up for Václav Havel in Prague, Czech Republic. That's where um, I'm broadcasting from right now. So. We look at this and we get the bio, we get a quick statement, and we're like, okay, he's got, um, he's in big famous galleries, and big, fam big famous museums, um, he is timely phenomenon, right? So that gives us the idea he's working with contemporary issues that are cropping up right now. We, we hear about politics, we know that his work involves politics as well in, in some sense, and then we get all these different things. Oh, he's architecture, installations, social media, documentaries. And he's also, you know, I know he's also doing ceramics, all this sort of thing. So we, we see somebody as a really contemporary artist working in a wide variety of mediums. But look how, this is a super famous artist, one of the most famous artists in the world. And look at how simple that artist statement is, right? So it's not the... It's not what we think, right? It's not the joke of the artist statement that we're told to believe that's convoluted and difficult to read. It's pretty simple, straightforward, right? So, tells when he was born. Okay, he was born in Beijing in 1957. All right. Didn't say that his dad did this or his mom did this. Or we don't need all that. We got it all. Here's another one. Um, uh, it's really short, which I kind of liked as well. My purpose, here's John McLaughlin. My purpose is to achieve the totally abstract. I want to communicate only to the extent that the painting will serve to induce or intensify the viewer's natural desire for contemplation without the benefit of a guiding principle. So, you know, my first thing that kind of pops into my head looking at this is supposed to be about kind of a, a Zen experience void of any um, ideological cues and we're supposed to just have this meditative experience looking at this white and black painting right so let's take five seconds look at the painting okay so desire for contemplation I don't necessarily like this, the viewer's natural desire for contemplation, because that's kind of implying you you know what I I have a desire for contemplation, right? Really? 
you you expect me to have that right so i i don't necessarily like that um language i don't like the fact that they talked about the viewer as well directly we've seen that a couple times intensify the viewer who who do you you don't need to call out the viewer directly like that um as well my purpose is to achieve the totally abstract without the benefit of a guiding principle done get rid of the rest i think that would be good one sentence another good thing to do can be to do a one paragraph artist statement one sentence statement and then a one word statement as well so that can be good here's yoshi yoshitimo nara when i focus my thinking sometimes i slip out of normal time into a world with no clocks as if in a time warp in that frozen time i begin a game of catch with the inspiration that comes from somewhere the sky throws me a ball i throw it back to the sky the sky throws me a ball i throw it back within myself the ball comes from within myself i throw it back into myself the ball comes from within myself i throw it back to the universe in any case this game of catch isn't with another person but a conversation i have with myself or a discussion with the universe i gaze into the mirror and become more conscious of myself and the world that spreads out infinitely around me living in a countryside so rural that fox wanders foxes wander about i feel that eternity when it's utterly dark outside sometimes with the moon shining and the stars twinkling before i know it the rock music blasting out of my stereo gets sucked away somewhere and i hear only the voices of the animals and the sounds of the rain and wind to catch inspiration i open my arms in my imagination increasing the antenna's sensitivity the overwhelming solitude of those moments turns into pleasure and lets me become one with the night i pick up my brush before i lose that sensation and have a conversation with the me that's inside the picture in this city called new york i will be presenting paintings drawings and sculptures born in these moments along with ceramics i was so excited to create that it felt like a hobby i hope that my inspiration reaches the audience wow it's so good um where do you even begin so it goes straight when i focus my thinking sometimes i slip out of normal time into a world with no clocks as if in a time warp what a great first sentence i mean if that was the first sentence of a book that would have me hooked right so that's the hook that's the first sentence immediately we're in this other world he is not even talking about himself in the work um but rather putting us somewhere else it's it's pure fiction it makes us feel fiction it makes us feel fantastical surreal in a different realm altogether and then we get into this exchange the sky throws me the ball i throw it back to the sky we have a poem which is basically like painting uh in a sense and this is really tricky i mean this would be hard to do well um but i think he pulls it off really really well here and then he brings in uh the foxes that wander about where he lives oh this person living in a countryside so real that foxes wander about i feel that eternity when it's utterly dark outside um but then he goes straight into here's the the goods right in this city called new york i will be presenting paintings drawings and sculptures born in these moments along with ceramics i was so excited to create that i felt like it felt like a hobby <laughs> really i mean when we 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 talk about creating work and he just went through this fantastic surreal experience and then he brings it back into a hobby it's something that it it's just fun to do it can be you and your grandma going to you know throw some pots together on a sunday in a in a small ceramic studio it can be fun and it doesn't have to be serious but at the same time we know it's serious and we know it's good so look at uh yoshi yoshitimo yoshi yoshitomo 
Nara's uh, works, and um, they're they're the big faces. Uh, you'll you'll recognize them. There just wasn't enough space, and I wanted to give the text more. So go check out his paintings to to get more information. Because I'm sure he, after reading this, you're like, what are those paintings looking like? It's a good example of a, an artist statement that's so good that you want to see the paintings, which is really rare. Here we have another one. Um, this is a performance artist. Considering the fact that I was born deaf, my learning process is shaped by American Sign Language interpreters, subtitles on television, written conversations on paper, emails, and text messages. These communication modes have often conveyed, filtered, and limited information, which naturally leads to a loss of content and delay in communication. Thus, my understanding of reality is filtered and potentially distorted. This is part of the core of my practice as an artist, and I am now taking ownership of sounds after years of speech therapy. Instead of seeking for one's approval to make correct sounds, I perform, vocalize, and or visually translate them based on my perception. As a visual and performance artist, it is always my intention to approach sound by constantly pushing it to a different level of physicality, and despite my complex relationship with deaf culture, I attempt to translate sound while unlearning society's views and etiquettes around it. Using my conceptual judgment and compromised understanding, I challenge and question its visual absence and sometimes tactile presence. Fortunately, with today's advanced technology such as computer programs and high bass speakers, I have been given alternative access to sound. It does not necessarily mean that it's a mere substitute or replacement of sound. So here we have, I think this is really great too, um, here we have an, an artist statement where they immediately give us the goods. Considering the fact that I was born deaf, my learning process is shaped by sign language interpreters, subtitles on television, written conversations, paper, emails, text messages. We know everything that first sentence tells us she as a deaf artist has an intermediary between herself and the understanding of the world and this is done by other people it's done by actual interpreters it's done by computers making up subtitles um, on television shows it can be somebody physically writing something down on paper in a restaurant or whatever we're looking at emails text messages it immediately gives us an idea that this person's view of the world is shaped by something we might not have considered. And not considering our, you know, dominant way of looking at the world is certainly an interesting place to begin in my mind as well. Um, here's Louise Bourgeois. And um, I know this statement is long, but it was it's one of the best artist statements I ever read. So we're just going to we're going to roll through it. An artist's words are always to be taken cautiously. Great way to start. I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to talk about, and uh, she says it in one sentence right there uh, with Tom Wolfe's book, the, the, the Painted Word, and all this other stuff. So let's start over again. An artist's words are always to be taken cautiously. The finished work is often a stranger to and sometimes very much at odds with what the artist felt or wished to express when they began. At best, the artist does what they can rather than what they want to do. After the battle is over and the damage faced up to, the result may be surprisingly dull, but sometimes it's surprisingly interesting. The mountain brought forth a mouse, but the bee will create a miracle of beauty and order. Ask to enlighten us, on their creative process, both would be embarrassed and probably uninterested. The artist who discusses the so-called meaning of his work is usually describing a literary side issue. The core of their original impulse is to be found, if at all, in the work itself. Just the same, the artist must, must say what they feel. My work grows from the duel between the isolated, individual, in the shared awareness of the group. At first I made single figures without any freedom at all, blind houses without any openings, any relation to the world. Later, tiny windows started to appear, and then I began to develop an interest in the relationship between two figures, 
The figures of this phase are turned in on themselves, but they try to be together, even though they may not succeed in reaching each other. Gradually, the relations between the figures I made became freer and more subtle, and now I see my works as groups of objects relating to each other. Although ultimately each can and does stand alone, the figures can be grouped in various ways and fashions, and each time the tension of their re relations makes for a different formal arrangement. For this reason, the figures are placed in the ground the way people would place themselves in the street to talk to each other, and this is why they grow from a single point, a minimum base of immobility which suggests an always possible change. In my most recent work, these relations become clearer and more intimate. Now the single work has its own complex of parts, each of which is similar, yet different from the others. But there is still the feeling with which I began the drama of one among many. The look of my figures is abstract, and to the spectator they may not appear to be figures at all. They are the expression, in abstract terms, of emotions and states of awareness. 18th century painters made conversation pieces. My sculptures might be called confrontation pieces. So Louise Bourgeois is just an epic um, artist statement of absolute greatness and placing yourself firmly as somebody being an artist. Ending with this, my sculptures might be called confrontation pieces. And we don't really feel very confrontational in, in most of this artist statement. We're even using words like freer. My, you know, my figures became more freer and more subtle. We don't necessarily think of being more free and more subtle and also being confrontational, which is exactly what Louise Bourgeois is, of course. So I think this is an amazing artist statement worth reading. Um, but starting it off, that is also pretty risky to go straight into it. An artist's words are always to be taken cautiously. Direct language, absolutely direct, concrete language, taking a stand. The artist statement takes a stand from the first sentence and sets us up for what is to come, um, which is really, really great. Here's Bill Viola's artist statement. And again, this is um, an artist statement that would kind of be, I think, a, an everyday uh, everyday person's artist statement. Bill Viola, born 1951, is internationally recognized as one of today's leading artists. Wow. <laughs> it's a bold claim. Right off the bat, he is. Um, I actually got to meet Bill Viola in Chicago, and he was super nice. Uh, we were in the Art Institute of Chicago's. There's like a gold, it, there's like a gold ceiling in, in this one room. And uh, he was sitting by himself, and I went up and just sat with him and started talking to him. He was, like, making little papers and writing on them, um, doing little drawings on little sketches of paper and saying, like, oh, you should sell this uh, sell this piece of paper, and then you can afford one of my books because uh, he was joking about how expensive the books were. Um, anyway, Bill Viola is internationally recognized as one of today's leading artists. First sentence, wow, we're going for straight... This is who I am in the world. I'm one of the most important leading artists in the world today. He has been instrumental in the establishment of video as a vital form of contemporary art, and in so doing has helped to greatly expand its scope in terms of technology, content, and historical reach. For over 35 years, he has created videotapes, architectural video installations, sound environments, electronic music performances, flat panel video pieces, and works for television broadcast. Viola's video installations, total environments that envelop the viewer in image and sound, employ state-of-the-art technologies and are distinguished by their precision and direct simplicity. They are shown in museums and galleries worldwide and are found in many distinguished collections. His single-channel videotapes have been widely broadcast and presented cinematically, while his writings have been extensively published and translated for international readers. Viola uses video to explore the phenomenon of sense perception as an avenue to self-knowledge. His works focus on universal human experiences, birth, death, the unfolding of consciousness, 
and have roots in both Eastern and Western art as well as spiritual traditions, including Zen Buddhism, Islamic Sufism, and Christian mysticism. Using the language of subjective thoughts and collective memories, his videos communicate to a wider audience, allowing viewer, viewers to experience the work directly and in their own personal way. So this is a, a great um, artist statement that is also just unbelievably matter of fact. They even describe what a video installation is. So we, you know, people that don't know what is a video installation? Is that when you go to a movie, right? Um, total environments that envelop the viewer in image and sound. That's a really straightforward way of saying what a video installation is. Um, but they employ state-of-the-art technologies and are distinguished by their precision and direct simplicity. So um, one of them, for instance, was that I saw before he had a, he had a tiny little camera on a drop and it was, you know, like a leaky faucet would drop and a little drop droplet would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, then there would be a little camera focused on that drop. That image was projected large of the, the water drop getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it would finally fall. And when it fell, it just hit a drum which was underneath it, and the drum had a mic on it, and it would just go, boom. And it was, it was really great. Um, so I can see that they're very precise, and they're very simple. Um, they're not necessarily, you know, impossible things uh, to, to have access to the technology itself, but they're, uh, they're really quite smart in that way. So I love that um, distinguish for their precision and direct simplicity. That's really direct and in great language in describing his work as well. So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this live stream. I'm going to be doing it more and more Sundays. If you haven't yet, uh, check out my podcast. It's on Spotify and uh, Stitcher and Apple Podcasts and Google Music and iHeartRadio and all that stuff. Um, so check out my podcast and uh, listen to some different every, uh, I don't know, every couple weeks, I guess, I'm making a new podcast where I'm just working with one artist and looking at that one artist and uh, looking a little bit about their life and their process and their paintings. And it's just a simple way to learn about one artist directly in every podcast. I'm working on a Philip Gustin one at the moment. The last one I did was Albrecht Altdorfer. And if you haven't already, head on over to Patreon and uh, become a Patreon member. And for $10 a month, I will send you a hand-drawn po postcard. So, um, and you can get these just as one-time buys as well, so you don't have to like subscribe to getting postcards from me. But if you would like a postcard from me, uh, you can sign up for 10 bucks, and you get a postcard in the mail with a hand-drawn thing in the front and a little note. Um, 15 bucks, you get a painted postcard, simple painting on a postcard that you get sent to you, and then uh, the VIP patron, 25 bucks, you get the painted postcard plus a, uh, an email portfolio review. So I will write a reply of 250 words on your artwork or on your artist statement and give you a critique on what you should improve in it. So check those things out and support me so I can keep making these videos. I really, really appreciate it. If you haven't done already, please like this and... Um, you know, ask me any questions that you may have, um, and we'll try to try to get to those in future live uh, live shows, whatever we call these <laughs> live streams, right? So thanks a lot for watching, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask.